like in this video, I'm gonna attempt to build the most complicated over-engineered jack ever made. Welcome back guys. Today is gonna be really interesting because I have an engineering challenge and I need to select a jack for this service truck. A hydraulic jack, a scissor jack, a trailer jack, or a high lift jack. This one uses a hydraulic ram to raise the arm. You get a lot of power, it's low profile, works pretty good. And then you have a scissor, which uses the mechanical advantage of a screw. Turn the screw, lifting action goes up. Pretty versatile, you find them in just about every back seat of every vehicle. And then you have the straight push force screw style where you turn the handle and then you have a extension of two components. This is for a trailer jack. And then you have a high lift jack. This uses a mechanical pin switching mechanism. This is to grab underneath a bumper of a large vehicle. You can pick something up that's sitting pretty high off the ground. That's a big advantage to these. And you can lift a long ways from floor all the way up to the top. So I actually don't want to use any of these. And I have my own idea on what I want to build for a jack. So let me show you what I want to build. How cool would it be if we added all the best features from these jacks and combined it into one? I know I want the jack to lift really high, so I'm going to be robbing parts from the high lift jack. I really like the simplicity from the hydraulic lifting arm, so let's add that into the mix too. The trailer jack has a really cool telescopic feature that definitely has to be added in. And I really like the handle style, which makes it easy to use and operate, so we'll incorporate that. I also like the low profile of the scissor jack, along with its screw design, so let's add that into the pot. And just in case there is an emergency on the side of the road, it'd be nice to have a vise. So we're gonna have to find some way to incorporate that. And then to make the jack more useful, I'd like to find a way to mount it to the back of a pickup truck. This is gonna make the vise way more usable and keeps it off the ground. So now that we've talked about the design of the Frankenstein jack, what do I actually want it to do? So here's my design parameters. The jack has to be strong enough to lift a one ton pickup truck to change its tires. I'd like the overall weight of this jack to be around 40 pounds. This is gonna make it easy to move and store behind the seat of the truck. The jack also has to be corrosion resistant because it might be out in the rain and the weather. I'd like to set a target goal of 10,000 pounds for the crushing strength of the vise. This is gonna give me adequate clamping force on anything I wanna put in the jaws. On most pickup trucks, I need 20 inches of height to change the tire, so that's gonna set how high the jack can lift. I have no idea if any of this is actually possible, but there's only one way to find out, and that's to actually build the thing. To get started, let's rob the feature from the trailer jack, where it has two sliding components that go in and out. This is gonna make up the main body of the whole jack, so everything's gonna be built off that. So let's get some parts cut. For the main body, I'm gonna be using three by three square tubing. And of course, to keep it corrosion resistant, I'm using stainless steel. This is gonna add some major problems a little bit later on that we're gonna talk about. We've got our two main body components of what's gonna make up this jack of all trades. Four part jack, jack vice thing. I don't know what this thing's called. And remember, this is the inspiration, is this trailer jack where we want one tube slipping inside of the other. And on our stainless steel tubing, we have one problem. We have a weld seam that is in our way. Yes, I could source stainless steel seamless tubing in this diameter and this size, but it's gonna be really hard to get and very, very, very expensive. The solution that I have I think we should cut a groove in the center of this to clear that ugly seam weld. So let's go over to the Acer mill and cut a groove in that. Okay, test fit number one. Oh, yes. Now that we have our tube sliding together nicely, it's time to add some wheels, which is a feature of the hydraulic jack. Now you're probably wondering, why in the heck does a jack need wheels? Well, let me show you. It's pretty obvious that the wheels help slide the jack underneath the vehicle, but that's not its main purpose. When lifting from one side of the truck, the truck rotates on an arc. And in this case, it's rotating counterclockwise, which is exactly the opposite direction of the hydraulic jack arm, which is rotating clockwise. If the jack didn't have wheels, the contact points where the truck and the jack meet, they would slide and separate and the truck would fall down. The wheels allow the jack to float, with these opposing forces and stay in contact with the vehicle. So without the wheels, the swing arm design just wouldn't work. For this project, I'm choosing to use quarter inch stainless steel plate. I'm gonna be using this for all the tabs and brackets. Hopefully this keeps the weight down and is strong at the same time. 
got my wheel brackets all cut out on the water jet, but there's a huge problem with these. The water jet does such a fantastic job of cutting them that it leaves a razor sharp edge on it. I honestly think I could whittle wood with them. That's just straight off the water jet. <laughs> That is so sharp. So in order to solve that, I'm going to chamfer every edge, even the inside of this hole with this little tiny tool. I know a lot of you guys ask me about it. it uses carbide inserts and it's basically a little router and we're gonna put a nice smooth to the touch little chamfer on the edge of all the pieces and get all these things welded on. I'll leave a link in the description below. So I have these little tabs. These are gonna be holding the wheel in place. Since this whole system is stainless steel, I'm gonna be using some 308 TIG wire. These tabs are going to wanna to lift up just like that when I weld it. So I have to make sure I clamp them down really well. I'm gonna be fighting distortion this whole time on this whole project. So I have to keep the welds to a minimum. So you're probably asking yourself, what is weld distortion? Well, in simple terms, it's the force that the weld applies to the material when it cools. And when a hot weld cools, it shrinks. And unfortunately, I'm using stainless steel for this project, and it is the worst with weld distortion. The welds really like to pull, causing my parts to go out of alignment. Wow, look at it lift up already. So let me flip it over, see if I can get it to come back. I get asked a lot when I made these squares, why did I make it have a complete 90 degree corner when I know people want to weld in a corner and this is interfering. I'm gonna use it as a reference point to transfer this tab down to the bottom. So if I butt this square right into that corner, then this tab should theoretically be in the exact same spot. And that's the beauty of this tool is that you can put 90 degree corners and have a room to weld right there or use it as a reference, much like this. No measuring required. That looks nice. Nice. It's now time to put some wheels on this frame, but normal off the shelf wheels just won't work. So we're gonna have to make some that can stand up to the weight that we wanna lift with this jack. So let's go make some. I'm choosing to use inch and a half solid stainless steel for the wheels. This will also keep the wheel strong and keep the ground pressure to a minimum. Did a good job of getting our tabs welded on nice and straight. Our pin to hold the wheels in goes right through. Yes. Fred Flintstone wheels. The next feature we need to fabricate is the heavy duty lifting arm taken from the hydraulic jack. It's gonna rotate from the same hole that the wheel is mounted to. I think making the arm out of this stainless steel plate is a great choice because stainless steel is pretty tough to bend, a lot harder to bend than mild steel is. I like water jet cutting the holes in stainless steel because drilling them out can be quite tricky. Every hole has a purpose and we'll talk about those as we move through the build. So here's my arms that I'm gonna make that lifting jack with, fresh off the water jet and all deburred and chamfered. And in order to get these things lined up, I've given myself little indicator tabs so that these things should click together with a little bit of force and that will take some of the fixturing out for me. When it doesn't fit, get a bigger hammer. <laughs> we have to make sure it's welded strong enough to hold all the weight of a vehicle. The other hard part, if this bracket warps and the legs start to come in, it will no longer saddle the tube. So this thing has to stay pretty straight. Already warped it. That looks good. Let's do a test fit. This goes in there like that. This pin. Look at that, the holes line up. That is so cool, making a robot. Well, not really. So now that this plate is captured with the pin, it really can't push left, can't push right. So the body's adding the extra strength into this arm that it needs. To add even more strength, we need to make a lifting pad out here. The lifting pad of the jack is a really important component. It's what comes in contact with the vehicle, distributing the pressure load across a much wider surface and preventing frame damage. As you can tell, it doesn't have any way to attach to the arm here. So we're gonna have to fold it to get it to reach around the sides. Any steel that I wanna keep strong, I try to bend cold. It just takes a lot more force to bend it. Does it line up? Look at that! I want this lifting foot to remain parallel with the ground, so I'm gonna need to fabricate some sort of strut to keep it level. This is where the weight gets tricky. 
I really want it to be strong, but I also want it to be lightweight. So I'm going to push the limits here and try to make everything as light as possible. We might have some bending when we go to try to pick the truck up. Take a look at what the water jet cut us. Some really cool control arms. So it goes point up. I hope these things are strong enough. If my calculations are correct, it should just slide through. Now, when we lift up, this thing should stay flat. Look at that, it's doing it. Hopefully they're strong enough. We're gonna find out when we go lift the truck. This jack is turning out awesome, but I'd also like it to be a clamp. So here's my plans on making that happen. I'd like this clamp to look more like a vise. So we need to fabricate some jaws that are offset from the main tube body. I'd also like to incorporate some way to hold something round, like a drive line or a drive shaft. So we need to put some jaws in there for that too. I'd like the jaws to be strong enough to maybe pull a bead off of a wheel, putting something in the jaws and hitting it with a hammer. And when I switch the jack to a high lift configuration, they're gonna be a really important component. I need to weld these right there on the side and it's gonna go clunk. And I also need to weld the dynamic jaw onto this side right there. So let's work on the main body first, get this sucker welded on. We have our lifting arm here. We got our vice jaws here. This is our sliding tube, and it also needs a matching set of jaws, which we have to weld on to this receiver tube. So everything's turning out wonderful. Now it's time to work on the jaws, and there's a problem with them, is that they're smooth. So let me show you my idea on how we can give these things some serious grip. The obvious solution to get some more grip out of the jaws is to put a knurl in it. A knurl is basically a raised pattern in the metal making a tooth-like structure. And it can come in many forms. You can get diagonal, cross hatch, but this time I'm gonna try something original and do a spiral. So I'd like to use this big gigantic Washan lathe to make the spiral cut in this vice jaw. I'm gonna chuck it up in the four jaw chuck and hopefully I'm gonna be able to cut some sort of spiral pattern into this block. I'm not gonna be able to use any power feeds on this lathe to get the perfect spiral. I'm going to have to do it all by hand. This is basically a interrupted cut, and it's helping me get my timing right to turn the handle. As the tool cuts, the machine makes this really cool rhythm, helping me advance the tool with every rotation. It's kind of a feel thing. That pattern is pretty wild. I like the handmade rings. You can tell they're not quite perfect, but that just adds to the overall art of the knurl. I like trying something new. Let's get our jaws fixtured and welded in. I'm gonna use the shop shims. The shims help me keep the distance between the two jaws perfect because I'm gonna be adding something in between there later. Here's the pipe jaws that I talked about earlier. Grip a number of things, these points in here. These vice jaws and this lifting mechanism has no way of working without some sort of power transmission. So let me show you my idea for that. To lift a car and to operate the vice jaws, I'm going to be using a screw. This is the key component to the whole jack. It has to work in compression and tension. So selecting the right screw is really important. If I choose the wrong thread pitch here, this whole machine will not work. So here's my choices. These are off the shelf, all thread. This one is a one inch, 14 threads per inch. This is considered a fine thread, which means I have to turn the handle 14 times to move one inch. This is a coarse thread, one inch. This is an eight threads per inch. And this is its stainless steel counterpart. This is a Acme thread, five threads per inch. This one's gonna move our mechanisms the fastest, but we're going to lose some power. This one's gonna rotate way too many times, but we're gonna have the most power. Because the whole construction of this vise is stainless steel, the obvious choice is to use the stainless steel thread. When the threads interfere with each other, when they get tight, they can generate a lot of heat and create what I call a galling effect. I'm just asking for a disaster by using stainless steel. I'm gonna choose the steel one inch, eight threads per inch. If I get this wrong, well, we'll have to do it all over again, but that's my pick. So we know we're gonna put a screw through the center of this tubing, but we don't have any way to hold the screw on each end. So I've water jet out some caps and pieces. These are going to be what's gonna hold this whole assembly together. 
and make it to where I can repair the screw if need be. What we gotta do is drill and tap all the holes and then we'll come back when we go to weld them in. This is the Champion XLT Tapper. You can find it in the link in the description. This flange has to be inside of this tube, but it won't fit because of the weld. So I gotta make a little groove there so it'll go inside of there and then we'll weld it in place. There you go. With the back of the tube capped off with some nice mounting locations, it's now time to look at the nut body. Every screw needs a nut and its position is really critical. Its location determines how far the vise can open up. The nut needs to be positioned as close to the jaws as possible. If it's too short, this is really gonna limit the travel that the vise can open up. So the nut body and the screw need to match and be the same length. So I'm gonna be using just a regular heavy duty hex nut. This is a grade eight, and I'm going to extend it out from the back with this inch and a half piece of square tubing. I've used round in the past, but this time I'm gonna use square because that's what I have. This nut needs to be very square in line with this tube. Also, we're gonna get some binding action. So I'm just gonna square up the end with the belt grinder. I'm gonna use it with these two pegs on the table. And I know this is 90 degrees. I know these pegs are 90 degrees. So we have a quick milling operation. That looks really square. So let's weld it on there. This nut is mild steel. This tubing is stainless steel. Can you weld mild steel to stainless steel? And the answer is yes, but you have to make sure you use stainless steel wire. If you tried to use mild steel to stainless steel, you're gambling. So this is the tube nut, and this is going to slip inside of this piece of three inch, but as you can tell, it's floating in here. There's nothing to attach it to. I need to put something on the back, like this flange, and weld the end of that tubing to it. And that way this tube nut is serviceable and we can replace it, fix it, do whatever we need to do. This will also be a nice seal. We could put some silicone around this and cap the end so moisture can't get in. If this flange isn't welded absolutely perfect, it will guide this tube in a weird direction. Therefore, the screw won't be able to align properly. I'm gonna be fighting distortion and I have to weld this all the way around for strength. I'm a little worried about this problem, but we're gonna see how it fits. I think the mega square here is gonna give me my best chance at success. These two little tabs on the end here are going to help me hold this thing perfectly square in both directions. That allows me to center up this tubing and then I can weld all the way around it while it still stays in the fixture. These are the Mantis grip pliers. They have a short side and a long side. Keep this out of my way. So I'm gonna put the long side over there. So it gives me room to weld. I'll leave a link in the description below where you guys can find these pliers. Now I have a little control of where this goes. How am I gonna get this flange in the center of this? Well, I don't even need a measuring tape. You can just use something like this. Three quarter, three quarter on this side. And I know it's three quarter on this side. I can just line it up with my finger, just like that. That is exactly in the center. This is the swivel base plier. As you can see, it rotates around the hole, giving me two inches of adjustment or this style, I only have one point of contact to choose from. See how it fits. What does it look like? Drum roll, please. Ooh. Ooh. That looks really, really, really centered by my eyeball. And I had it calibrated last week. Look at that. Boom. This is the part I tapped earlier and I need to get that welded right there. So we've chosen the one inch eight threads per inch screw. Now I need to get it installed and find a way to turn it on the end. So we need to make a handle that we can replace the screw on it later if necessary. So for this screw, I would like everything to be replaceable on it. So just in case the threads wear out, we can put a new one on. So here's my idea on how we're gonna do this. I'm gonna use a stainless steel nut. This nut's gonna be able to hold all the weight we wanna transfer to it, but we need a way to turn it with a handle. So I'm gonna add this piece onto the threads just like that, and then I will weld the nut to this knob. This gives me the option to grip onto this nut with a wrench or turn the screw with a handle. Now it's time to get the energy to transfer into the vise, and I'd like to use a thrust bearing for that. 
I would like to avoid metal-to-metal -metal contact. Two metal parts that come together under pressure generate a lot of heat, therefore friction, and I'd like to avoid that. So the best way to do that is to add a thrust bearing. Thrust bearings have balls that roll instead of metal-to-metal -metal that slide, reducing the friction and making it easier to turn. And it just slips over the screw and butts up against that nut. Then we have a water jet cut plate steel that goes over the top of this. And that's what that whole assembly pushes on. But there's one problem to this. When we turn the handle, the side load of the screw is gonna be touching this piece of plate steel. So to prevent that extra friction, we need to make a little machined pocket for this bearing to sit into. I'm gonna bore this out on the lathe and we're gonna hold this square with the four jaw chuck. So a fast way to get center on this, is we're just gonna use the tailstock. So let's start putting this together. Thrust bearing, cap, thrust bearings on the back side, and then to hold that all together, we need another nut. Spins good, but we don't want this nut to back off, so I'm gonna add another one, a jam nut. Let's get it installed and see how it looks. Look at that. But this is completely inefficient. We need to make ourselves a handle. Because this is a jack, I'd like to put a jack handle on it instead of the traditional vice handle. The vice handle would typically just be a straight rod. We cut it off whatever length we want. But the problem with this style handle is that when we go to store the vice behind the seat of a pickup truck, this handle just always sticks out and it's in the way. The jack handle is kind of unique. It has a 90 degree turn on it so that when you go to store it, look at that, the handle kind of stores to the side. And I'd like to copy this element and put it on this tool. So for the handle on the jack, I would like to use some wood instead of aluminum or steel. And I have a pretty good assortment of hardwood here. We could choose something like this purple heart, maybe some marble wood. If you guys remember this piece, this is the red burl from Big Vice Project. Could use some of that. But I've been chomping at the bit to try out this. This is a piece of snake wood. One of the hardest woods I know of. This thing's a tank. I think it's gonna make a great handle. If you've never seen snake wood before, it has a really unique grain pattern. I see it a lot in high-end knives, so I know it's gonna make a really good handle. Never drilled this wood before. Oh man, it drills like steel. So how hard is this snake wood? Let's compare it to some wood you're probably familiar with, like red cedar. It lands at 350 on the Jenka scale, which is quite low. Black walnut falls at 1000 on the Jenka scale, and they use walnut in high-end furniture. And snake wood has an impressive 3800 Jenka rating. That is really hard. I didn't have a stainless steel nut to fasten the knob. So I just turned one down on the lathe, domed the top of it, and cut some flats on the milling machine. This way I can put a wrench on it. Yeah, that looks good. I'm going all out on the handle, and even the shaft is made out of stainless steel. But I want to put that 90 degree bend in it, just like the trailer jack has. So I'm using my press, because stainless steel is really hard to bend. I'm going to try to get to 10,000 pounds with this handle, and I really hope that this doesn't bend back straight again. I'm also pinning it in place, that way the handle can never fall out or get lost. If this bent handle doesn't work, I'll definitely go back to the traditional straight vice handle. So I have one more problem I like to solve, and that is to get all the possible combinations of this jack to work. So let me show you the solution I'd like to try. To get every one of these vice styles or configurations to work, I'm gonna need a key component, and I'm gonna call it the drag link. So when this link is added, it transmits the vice movement into the lifting arm movement. This is what makes lifting with a vice possible. I'm choosing to make the drag link out of two by two square tube. That's the same exact size we need to go into the trailer hitch. Got the drag link all drilled up and beveled for our clearance. Now I want to add a little gripper tab that's gonna sit right here that I need to weld in next. And this sucker will be done. And we can try it out and I can show you how this drag link actually really works. This is looking pretty epic. I wanna try it out, but before I do, I wanna clean it all up. 
I want to sandblast it, get it looking pretty, and then we can test it with the probe and see how this thing lifts in all the configurations. This thing has turned out even more amazing than I can imagine. I just love that satin finish on the stainless steel. It rolls really, really nice. The handle is stored away perfect. That way it's out of the way from behind the seat of a pickup truck. But the next thing I wanna do, I tried to make this around 40 pounds. So let's see if I came close. I got a scale over here. Oh, what she weigh? 73 pounds. Oy, I missed that one by a long shot. We'll call this one the heavy duty model. <laughs> this jack is in the neutral or stored position. Let's pull the handle out. Now, if we pull this pin and this pin, what comes out is this drag link. It looks like a two inch receiver tube that goes right here. Boom. And now, Boom, look at that. We got a vise on a truck. There's a couple negatives I'm worried about is how well this handle holds its shape. Will it stay bent on me? Maybe. You're probably wondering how in the heck are you gonna open and close this vise fast? Well, if you notice, if you just make a circular motion around the pin, that the handle opens. This opens really fast, vice versa. Remember we put the swivel on the handle, so I can just grip it with my fingers. It actually works really well. It's a pretty good compromise from a traditional handle. And then when we want power, we can come closer to 90 degrees, and it's very unconventional, but I think it's gonna work. How strong is it? <clears throat> oh, pretty strong. Will the tailgate open and not interfere? Yes. Works just like I planned it. The next thing I'd like to test are these serrated pipe jaws. I wanna see how well they hold. This would simulate maybe needing to repair an axle, hold your drive shaft. I have no idea what you need this for. I just thought I'd include it because, well, I can. If there's anything one inch in smaller diameter, the jaws will hold. Might have to go back and revise that so it'll hold a one inch somewhere in there. Jaws hold that pretty good. Let's try something a little bit bigger. Let's try this piece of uh, exhaust tubing. It grips that good. Gotta be careful, I'll just crush it. So let's put a meter in between these jaws and see if it can make 10,000 pounds. And just to remember that this is kind of like the worst case scenario. You might need a vise stranded on the side of the road somewhere. At least you got it if you need it. 2,000, really easy to turn. 4,000, 5,000, 7,000, mm, 8. <laughs> Am I gonna make it? Almost. <laughs> That's a lot of, yes. I did it. I met my goal. Woo! 10,000 pounds is a lot for a vise. That is really good news. Just with some of that quarter inch plate, the jaws are strong enough. My handle did not bend. Yes! Woo, that makes me happy. All right, let's take it apart and let's try to lift the pickup truck over here and see if we can change a tire. So this lifting arm has no way to move up and down by itself. So let's put the drag link in. Now it's attached to the moving jaw. Let's put the wheels in, because we know this thing has to roll. All right, so we know we have 10,000 pounds of screw force with this handle. We're not gonna get that with this lifting arm. So what I mean by that is look at this, from this pin to this pin is only six inches, and then from here to here, it's a lot longer. So we are losing force. It's gonna be close, this may not lift the rear end of this one ton. These little arms also might bend when we start pushing down on this pad. So cross our fingers that these hold up. So let's pretend I need to change this inside tire on the dually and I need to pick just these two wheels up. So I'm gonna pick up right on that chalk perch, see if I can get them off the ground. Now remember, I gotta loosen the vise to go up. Okay, I'm gonna go a little bit more. But yes, the tires are off the ground. Woo, a lot of force. That's probably the maximum I tried to lift in this configuration. What surprised me was how much force and effort it took to lift just one tire up with this lifting arm. I would probably save this feature for something or a car lightweight, 
But what happens if we needed to pick up the whole rear end of this thing? So let's convert it over to a hijack scenario and try to pick it up by this trailer hitch. I think that's a good test. So in order to get this to happen, let's pull it all apart. We're gonna stand it up. This lifting arm, which I'm surprised hasn't failed yet, is gonna be the stabilization foot. And it goes right there. Now, this drag link is our lifting arm. And it goes right here, just like that. And these little grippies give you an option not to slide off, so you could use them to put on the bottom of the metal or come back over here and it kind of gives you a little bit of a stop. As you can see in this configuration, if the jack were to tilt, or tip a little bit that this foot's gonna stay in contact with the ground. It's virtually a couple inches back from the end of the lifting arm. But if you flip it this way, now it binds up and now it's further past the end of this lifting arm, basically extending out another three inches or so. Let's see if we can pick it up right through the receiver tube. There we go. Oh, this is really easy. A lot of weight on there. It looks like it's staying straight. Yes, all four tires off the ground. It's pretty stable though. Remember all that weight is on that one inch screw inside there and that's a long screw. So this configuration worked wonderful, except for this truck has a lot of suspension travel and I had to lift it quite a bit higher than I was expecting. The ratio of the screw, it was much easier to turn. It felt like the jack was pretty stable and wasn't gonna slip out. Uh, the foot tilted a little bit, which was good, followed the path of the truck, the curve. Uh, would I want to use this jack in this configuration all the time? No way. But in a pinch, it would absolutely work. What I'd like to try next is to lift the front end up of this pickup truck. It is much heavier than the back. If we wanted to change a front wheel and tire, I'm gonna need a configuration of this jack that's gonna give us the maximum lifting capacity. So let's move it to a scissor jack configuration and let's try to lift the front end up. The next thing we wanna do is flip it over onto its top. Open up the vise all the way up. Put a wheel on the end, just like that. That pin there, and these two arms go back here. This pad goes here, and now we have a lifting jack. Come on, little Jackie Poo! So let me explain to you how this scissor configuration actually works. As you can see, I have a roller wheel on this end, and what happens is when I turn the jack in, everything starts to erect up and then stays anchored on this jaw in the front. And this allows this whole assembly to slide and glide easily up. Now, as you can notice, this is not fixed in one position. And what happens is this is going to find a neutral position on the mounting point on the frame of the pickup truck. Let's cross our fingers we have enough power to lift the whole front end of this truck up. Yes, we did it. It's up. Now that is just cool. Everything looks okay, except for my little control arms here. They are bending quite a bit. There's a lot of weight on those arms. So this might be a potential design flaw, but we don't know till we test it. So let's bring it back down and check out the damage. Definitely bent it. So I have two solutions to solve this bending arm problem. The first one is I've made this new foot. This new foot now puts this arm in tension instead of compression by swiveling it around this pin. So when the load gets pushed down over here, it pulls these rods tight. We lose a little bit of reach, but I think it's a great solution to the problem. I don't really like the way it looks. I like the way this one looks better, but it compromises. The other way we could fix it is just by going with sheer mass. This is two arms doubled up with a spacer in the middle of it. This is basically gonna double the capacity this thing can hold. It's now three quarters of an inch thick. This is heavy, and especially when you add two on each side, you're just making this thing even heavier than already is. But those are two solutions to this problem. What do you guys think we should name this thing? Please leave that in the comments below also. I'd like to know your ideas. If you'd like to build your own jack vise, I'm gonna leave the plans and the DXF files on the Fireball Tool website, so find them there. And I will see you guys on the next one, so thanks for watching.